My name is Tom Morimoto. I was born in Edmonton and uh, moved to Fort McMurray in uh, 1921 with my parents when I was not quite three years old. I believe I'm uniquely privileged because of my age. Uh, I'm 96. You know, I'm one of the very few people, perhaps the only person still alive, who has this link to Fort McMurray's historic past. Uh, uh, and the, uh, the, because I've grown up amongst some of the outstanding men who played a prominent part in opening up Canada's north. So I'd like to tell you about some of the notable men whom I knew or knew of. Now, from early days, Fort McMurray has been the aptly named Great Gateway to the North. Today, access to the North is by both railway and highway from Edmonton to Fort McMurray, where they link up with the Athabasca River for travel to the North. However, long before there were any railways or highways in Canada, the principal means of transport, transportation to um, the north was by water. Uh, therefore, goods had to be transported uh, during the summer, as the only means of transportation in the winter was by dog team or on foot. The uh, system of, of, of uh, the history of uh, tra travel, uh, of historic travel route. Uh, to the north was by a system of lakes and rivers from either Hudson's Bay or Eastern Canada, uh, which led to the Methy Portage. Uh, the uh, the Methy Portage led to the Clearwater River and then the Athabasca River waterway to the north. The first white man to travel over the Methy Portage was Peter Pond in 1775. So uh, after Peter Pond's discovery, uh, this became the sole route to the north for almost 100 years. Now, when I was growing up in Fort McMurray, the Methy Portage was a thing of the past, but there still lived in Fort McMurray uh, an ex-voyager by the name of Paul Fontaine. Paul didn't know how old he was, but said he was born in the uh, s summer of the uh, fire in St. Boniface. So it was presumed that he was born in 1843. He lived in a log house just off Franklin Avenue and I think it's about Morrison Street. Uh, he, pa Paul, uh, with his long beard and, and uh, bowler hat, he still walked with the characteristic stride of a voyager with his head bent slightly forward and his arms swinging from side to side. He lived in a log house just off uh, at Fra uh, Franklin Avenue, as I said. Uh, he, uh, he, he had uh, was invited to dinner to my de father's place one day and I was uh, interested to see how he ate because he ate all the things that he liked first. So he ate his apple pie first and then he ate his steak and then he ate his potatoes and then he ate his vegetables last. <laughs> the main disadvantage of the Methy Portage route was the arduous backpacking of goods across it. Uh, and uh, this disadvantage led to its uh, gradual demise and this uh, began in 1867 when uh, Louis Fosenov, who was known as Captain Schott, uh, uh, made a trip down the, uh, he took Bishop Farrow's skull down the Laclabish River to the Athabasca River, and then performed the uh, unprecedented feat of taking it through the Grand Rapids the fearsome Grand Rapids. <clears throat> the, um, wait, I got things mixed up here a little bit. Uh, 
Then, uh, 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 Cap Captain Schott uh, accomplished uh, some un unprecedented, uh, uh, made this unprecedented feat of taking through the Grand Rapids. And after, uh, uh, Captain Schott was the first and foremost of the uh, 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 men who dominated transportation in Canada's north. I didn't know Captain Schott as he died in 1913, but I knew his sons, uh, Emil and Joe. Emil was a no noted dog musher and had a team of dogs that were purported to be half wolf. They were very fierce and um, attacked and almost killed my boyhood friends, Ronald and Ann Morrison, when they were kept quite young. After Captain Schott uh, showed that the Grand Rapids could be conquered, others followed suit and the Athabasca River began to take over from the Methi port Portage, especially after the uh, uh, Canadian Pacific Railway was completed in 1885. Then goods began to uh, be brought from uh, eastern Canada by rail to, to Calgary and then by uh, horse and wagon to Edmonton and the final hundred miles to Athabasca Landing where they were loaded onto scows for the trip down the Athabasca. Uh, as the Athabasca became the primary transport, transportation route, uh, the, uh, so, some, some of the independent traders would take their scows on their own from Athabasca Landing, but, but the main flotilla of some dozen or more scows would be those of the Hudson's Bay Company under the command of John McDonald. Uh, John McDonald was the first settler in Fort McMurray and uh, McDonald Island, lived on McDonald Island, which is named after him. Uh, Ernest Thompson Cedar, the author who wrote Arctic Prairies, traveled on with his flotilla down the Athabasca in 1907. And he, he mentions an incident which happened during, the, during this trip uh, John, John wanted to take advantage of the high water which prevailed at the time, but the voyagers rebelled and said, said that they didn't want to work on a Sunday. So, uh, as Seaton describes it, John said nothing, uh, but boarded the cook scow and set off down the river with the cook scow and all the grub. <laughs> and the rebellion was over in five minutes. And, and the so, so uh, Satan described it that John said nothing but grinned at me only with his eyes. Now I knew big John McDonald, he was the most genial man and always seemed to have a twinkle in his eyes. So I understand very well when Satan says he grinned at me only with his eyes. Then there was John Sutherland who came from Thurso, Scotland at the age of 19. He came via Hudson, uh, Hudson's Bay, the Methi Portage, to Chipewyan uh, in 1883. He then assisted Captain J.W. Smith in uh, building the first steamboat on the, in the north, the SS Graham in 1894. Uh, 1884, sorry. Uh, the SS Graham was launched in 1884 and made the maiden trip from uh, Fort Chipewyan upstream on the Athabasca to Fort McMurray in 30 hours. And this amazed both uh, voyagers and, and, and uh, northerners alike because uh, this trip would have taken a, a real gang of voyagers uh, several weeks to make the same trip. Uh, the the uh, SS Graham was uh, built by uh, uh, Captain J. W. Smith and uh, William Wiley. William Wiley had uh, was a blacksmith who had come from, to Chipewyan from uh, Scotland in 1863. He built both of the um, iron oak and even made the nails. Uh, then there was John Sutherland, who, who uh, 
No, I, I said, he, he, the, uh, not John Sutherland, there was after him, uh, the, probably the uh, most legendary figure of them all was uh, Billy Ludet, William Cornwallis Ludet, fondly known as Billy. Uh, his outstanding walking trips and prowess as a guide and riverboat pilot have made him a, a legend. In 1907, he served as a guide for Ernest Thompson Seton on his trip to the Arctic. And Seton had nothing but praise for him, saying, sturdy, strong, reliable. And when it came to the portages, he would shoulder his 200 pounds or 250 pounds each time. In 1940, 14, Billy was the first man to take a steamboat through the, through the Grand Rapids. I asked his uh, widow, Jenny, about this, and she said, Everybody told Billy he's crazy to take a steamboat through the Grand Rapids. But Billy, he wait and he wait for the high water. Finally, after several days of rainfall, the river water, uh, river, the river water level rose and Billy made it safely through the Grand Rapids and the succeeding 10 rapids to Fort McMurray. Uh, I remember uh, spending an, an evening at uh, Billy's house one evening. We spent a riotous evening singing hymns. Uh, Billy loved the hymns, and uh, while his wife played the accordion, and Scotty Morrison, who knew all the hymns, led the singing. And after he'd finished one hymn, Billy would urge him to sing another one. So uh, um, after... Uh, after Billy Ludet showed that the Grand Rapids could be conquered, uh, Jim Cornwall and Joe Bird uh, emulated his feat with the Northland Echo. Uh, uh, Joe, Joe Bird was an eminent river man. I didn't know him as he died when I was quite young, but I knew his widow and his son, Billy Bird, who became an eminent riverboat pilot. Uh, 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 Ernest Thompson Seton says about Billy Ludet, uh, after, after uh, Billy, Billy had uh, captured uh, uh, his bag, which had capsized on their trip up the Athabasca from, from Fort McMurray, and uh, Billy, Billy Ludet and the two guides, Billy Ludet and LZR Robillard, immediately began riving down, down uh, along the riverbank downstream in, in pursuit of the bag. And the bag contained 600 pages of uh, observations and 500 sketches that Ernest Thompson Seton had made during his Arctic trip. And after running many miles down the, down the river, they finally uh, retrieved the bag. And Seton says, my heart swelled with gratitude to the brave boys who had sudden, slidden, tumbled, fallen, swam, and climbed those perilous, horrible 14 miles to save the bags, which they knew, which uh, to them seemed of so little value, but which they yet knew were to me the most precious of all my things. After uh, uh, Billy Ludet showed that the uh, Grand Rapids could be conquered, uh, Jim Cornwall and, and Joe Bird uh, emulated his feet with the Northland Echo. The isolation of the North Country was finally ended in 1939 when Wapmay's commercial airways began uh, scheduled flights to the north as far north as the Klavik with air mail, passengers and freight. I, I knew Wap and, and his wife Vi used to play softball with them. Vi was a very good athlete and probably Canada's top equestrian. Uh, uh, I later worked for Wap May as a, an apprentice radio operator at, at Fort McMurray. I worked for a year for no pay. They finally paid me $30 a month. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I learned to become a Morse code operator, and this assisted me when I 
tried to join the Army in, in 1940. I was accepted by the Royal Canadian Corps of Signals and the 3rd Canadian Division. And uh, I then spent five years and four months in the Army, most of it in England. I landed on D-Day and uh, uh, went through the whole Northwest Europe, Europe campaign. I don't think that many people know of the many kind acts that Walt May performed. In my case, when my mother died in, at Fort McMurray in 1938, I was in Yellowknife looking for a job and didn't have any money. And Walt arranged for my fare back to Fort McMurray to attend her funeral. And then he let me pay the uh, paint the hangar at Fort McMurray to earn my return fare to Yellowknife. Thank you. <laughs>